for you, Rosemary. This is a review sheet here, okay? Uh, we're gonna just talk about the test, which is on Monday. Uh, those of you that were going yesterday, uh, you need to make sure you watch that movie, uh, The Healthy, A Healthy Constitution, okay? Very helpful on the test, uh, especially for the Founding Fathers part on the matching part of the text. Speaking of the text, uh, there will be, to start, 19, fill in the blank. Nice. Somebody's paying attention. Those Ten of those will be amended. So nine fill in the blank outside of the amendment. So the amendment part will go the blank amendment, da 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 da. And you tell me what number. There's no uh, number bank on that. <laughs> one, in one, in yeah, one in 27 chance on that. Will they, will like there be any repeats? Or no. One each time? No. Uh, the other fill in the blank, uh, deal with, okay, so remember what we talked about in this, this section, which has been a long time, okay, so we started with the Articles of Confederation, right, the failures of the Articles of Confederation, the strengths of the Articles of Confederation, then we got into um, the need for a new constitution, so we started talking about the Constitutional Convention, who was there, who wasn't, what were the plans that went into it, yes, and then what they settled on, and that involves things like, um, you know, the Great Compromise, the Three-Fifths Compromise, uh, how our legislature is set up for representation, okay, national supremacy of the national government. You got seven articles in the U.S. Constitution, the first three of the first three branches, right? Legislative, executive, and judicial in that order, okay? So uh, in that, we talked about then once they wrote the thing, once they wrote the Constitution, there was an argument over it, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, yes? And then you had the Federalist Papers published by? Okay, Madison, Hamilton, and Jerry, okay? And, um, and, and they were in support of it, okay? Um, it just occurred to me looking at this test. I talked about federalism briefly, but I did not do the whole notes on federalism. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. I should do that now. Uh -oh. There goes our entire class. Yes. <laughs> you got two minutes, you can do it. <laughs> I got time to do it. Okay. Here we Let's go. keep talking about the test, and I'm going to give you some more information on federalism and tell you what's important and what's not. Okay. Um, all right, so you got you got your 19 matches, then you got um, 12 fill in the blank, or 12 started, multiple choice, okay? And these deal mostly with the founding fathers, okay? Um, you've got a list of founding fathers on there on your review sheet, okay? Uh, did anybody look up Governor Morris? Well, look him up. Uh, he's famous for a couple different things. All right. He's famous for two things. If you look at the Constitution, the document itself, it's his handwriting. Ooh. Okay, and he also is responsible for writing the preamble to the Constitution. Do you think they did the thing when you sit in class and they're like, who is the best handwriter? And they had to like, yes. do it like, they all wrote something? And they, well, I think they, they probably like, read each other's letters and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Governor Morris. Yeah. Funny if the who day. became a governor. So his name is Governor. Wait, he was the governor of Governor Morris. <laughs> Not making that up. I thought you were just saying governor. I thought that was a typo. I thought, yeah. His name's governor. Okay. Why now, that's so stupid. A lot of the information you could have gotten on these founding fathers from the video and or my lecture. Okay. Then, here we go. Short answers. Okay. These are your two pointers. These do not, I repeat, do not need to be in complete sentences. 
If I ask you to tell me two things, just tell me two things. It's a lot easier to grade that way. Yes, I know that's sir. hard for some of you who are, you know, anal and stuff like that. Okay. So, you ready? They go something like this, and there are ten of them. Ten two-pointers. What were the two? What was the only? List two. Give one example of eight and one example of eight. List two. Define. Define, we give one example, explain, describe what the, you don't like the that class. would be, that one could be complete. <laughs> what was the most, adjectives. what is the most common? Okay, and then there's three medium answers worth five points each. Now, think big here, right? Think big, thematic, things we talked about. I've mentioned two of them already today. No. Articles of Confederation. Okay, what about it? Strength and weaknesses. Okay. And then the. The. Founding fathers. <laughs> Constitution. What about the cons what? What compromise? Oh. oh, a little Virginia. You got a little Virginia in there. You got a little New Jersey in there. You gotta give me a little of those. Okay, well, how they were different and what they compromised on, which was what we wound up with. No, 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 no. Three fifths is not great. The bicameral legislator. She's the bicameral legislator. Okay. All right, you got two, right? All right, now what's left? Uh, the last, I don't know if I showed you the slide. Did I show you the slide? Checks and balances. I don't think so. All right. Uh, get your camera phones out. my uh, chapter on federalism with my regular class. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly with you um, and talk about federalism. Okay. Now, some of you guys, I think like 12 of you turned in the uh, homework. Oh, I 
Okay. I haven't graded that yet. And I forgot to mention you guys the amendment homework on page 57 or whatever. It's in your book. Does, that, does anybody ever look in their book? Okay. There's an assignment in there worth 27 points. Okay. I'll put it on the thing and you guys can turn it in over the weekend. Okay. If you want to do it, it's optional. Okay. Again, some of you might wind up with a 23 out of 27 there. For some of you, that'll be good. Some of it won't be good. I'll take it out if you don't like it. What's the page number again? No, yeah. it's out of what page? 59. No, 59. No. Page 59. Okay, you and I are saying the same. Okay. What was yours? Never mind. Okay. <laughs> so the federalism homework was page 61. So listen, that little write-up on federalism on page 60 and 61 with the different types of powers expressed, implied, inherent, co concurrent, uh, powers denied, and so forth. Know that for the test, page 60-61, okay? Now, federalism. You guys know it is defined as the sharing or division of power between national, state, and local governments. We went from a confederal system where all the powers at the local level to the state level, to, and the national government didn't have any, to one that shares. We do have national supremacy in Article 6 of the Constitution, the Supremacy Clause, okay? Okay? Okay, now, when we look at the growth of federalism, guys, throughout history, it's changed. They debated it at the very beginning. We've been debating federalism ever since they wrote the new Constitution. The Civil War was about federalism. The southern states wanted to keep this institution of slavery, and the northern states says, well, we're going to ban it as a country. And they said, no, we're not. And they said, yes, you are. And they said, fine, we're going to leave. And they said, no, you can't do that. And they said, well, come stop us. And so they did. What was the argument over? Slavery, but yes, it was over federalism. Who got to make that decision whether it was going to be slavery or not? The states or the national government? And we know who won, right? And usually the federal government does win that argument. It's a tug of war. It's going on today. The mask mandate, right? If Joe Biden would, could, He'd put a national man -made mandate on everybody in the country, but he can't. Because of what? Federalism. <laughs> <laughs> you with me? You follow me? Okay, now, this is what's transpired really since the 1970s, so we're talking about the last 50 years. Okay? When we go back to the New Deal, and we all studied the New Deal, we found out that, you know, that the national government started doing more and more and more than it ever had before, Right? Okay, so how does it get more control in the states? Now, this cooperative front federalism is like the FBI helping find BTK, right? We got a local mass murder, what do you call him, serial killer, right? And the FBI is, FBI is going to help us. Anybody say anything wrong with that? Nope, I don't either. And sometimes local law enforcement will help the FBI with a federal case, yes? Anything wrong with that? Nope, sounds good, it works. It's cooperative federalism, okay? No issues there. Okay. The National Guard is trained and funded by the U.S. government, but the governor of Kansas can use the Kansas National Guard if necessary in an emergency. We're helping each other out, right? Works pretty good. In the 1970s and early 80s, we saw something called revenue sharing. This is where things are going to start to change. Okay, revenue sharing, write that down. Federal tax dollars shared with state and local governments. Now, this is a situation where they say, hey, look, um, the federal government says we have some money left over, okay? We're going to send it back to the states and let them share it with them. If you ever go for a, go work at a corporation that has revenue sharing, like say the corporation has a great year and they make a bunch of money, they want to reward the employees, they give you revenue sharing, they help you out, or they'll sell you stock at a lower price than the general public can buy that company's stock. It's called revenue sharing. Follow me? Now, when the national government did this, I'm going to use an analogy. It's kind of a weird analogy, but try and stay with me on this analogy, okay? Think of this revenue sharing, this money that the national government... Now, this money that the national government is going to give back to the states, where does it originate? It's, it originates in the states. We send it to Washington, D.C., and they're like, hey, we're going to be nice to you, and we have some left over. We're going to give you some money. Okay, whose money is that? It's our money. Okay, but they think they're being nice to us. So think of this money as crack. <laughs> crack is a drug. Crack kills. Don't do crack. Okay, now, I'm going to give you this crack for free. All right, I want you to try this out. Hey, 
try this out. It makes you feel really good. You're going to like it. Okay, you like this money, right? You want some more of that, okay? So you take the money, and what do you do with it? Well, what, what could the state of Kansas do with this revenue stream? They could hire more teachers. They could hire more police officers, right? They could do some good things with it. They could build some roads and stuff like that. But let's say you do hire some teachers. Okay, what about next year? You're still going to need money to pay those teachers that you just hired last year. So guess what? You're going to want more money from the national government. So you can do that. You follow me? Okay, now next time you come to me and you say, I got you addicted to this crack, right? And you say, I want some more of that crack. Then I'm going to say, okay, I got you. Gotcha. Okay, now in order to get this money, you're going to have to do what I tell you to do. And this is exactly what the national government has done to the states. It says, if you want this money, you got to follow our rules. With me? Okay, so that's a quick analogy there. Now, Guys, people like me in the 70s and 80s and my dad and my mom are like, hey, the national government spent too much money. It's sending this money to the states that it doesn't have. We're in debt. Why are they doing that? You know what I mean? So there was pressure to cut spending. This is the Reagan years. This is the Carter years. Okay, Reagan was spending all this money on military, trying to win the Cold War. Okay, we're building all these new ships and missiles and stuff like that. Okay, and so... There was pressure, so they didn't get rid of it. They just changed the name of it. So no longer it's called revenue sharing. They're going to be called grants, okay? And I'm going to talk about different types of grants, and this is how government does it today, okay? So really, you need to know what revenue sharing is. That's kind of where it starts. Okay, so we're going to talk about the grant system. You don't have to write all this down, okay? And this is just a little history of the grant system. This is not the first time they did it. You guys probably learned about some of this in history last year. Okay, money, other resources, federal government provides local uh, and state activities used for specific projects, authorized by who? Okay, now, land ordinance in 1785, they set aside public lands for schools, public schools. So, like, what you see at Northwest High School, that big plot of land was set aside a long time ago for a school, okay? And you guys might have learned about this, the Morrill Act of 1862. Did you learn about this? Morrill Act, guys, was... Um, uh, the, the federal government gave money to the states to establish universities. Most of these universities at the beginning were all A&M universities. K-State was the first one established by the Morrill Act. Okay. What is an A&M? What does that stand for? Agriculture and... Mechanics. Oh. What is K-State going for? And engineering. engineering, mechanics. You with me? Okay, that's what AM stands for. All right? So, and then sometimes they'd send uh, grants for transportation systems, roads, housing for the needy. We saw that during uh, the New Deal with Roosevelt. Okay, good? All right, now, moving on. So, you get into two types of grants we see today. Okay, write this one down categorical grants. These are very specific, they're, they're in categories. Okay, so um, so you might see this for specific activities like airports, not transportation. That would be broad, right? With transportation, the state of Kansas could use it for whatever transportation needs they wanted. But in this case, the national government wants you to spend it on airports, so guess what? You spend it on airports. If you want the money. Unemployment compensation, fighting crime, that could be a little bit broad. Natural disaster aid is a big one that we see, guys, right? Like with the forest fires, hurricanes, tornadoes. You see a national declaration uh, of, a, of a disaster, okay? Then uh, you qualify, your state or community qualifies for federal money. Categorical grant. You with me? Very specific. All right? Now, here you go. You want this money. Guess what you got to do? You're required to contribute some of your own funds as well. So if you want money for airports, guess what? Your state legislature is going to have to allocate a certain amount of money towards what? Airports, if you want to get the money. The big one here, guys, is Medicare. Excuse me. Medicaid. This is the one, this is the health care for the poor and poor children. Medicaid. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Now, so like under Obamacare, the big thing was the federal government will give you a bunch more money if you expand Medicaid. But in order to expand Medicaid, state dollars have to be allocated for that as well. 
So see if you can stay with me here. When we go to the ballot vote box and vote in Kansas to elect our state legislature, our state legislature taxes us. Kansas is the ninth highest tax state of the 50. Okay, so the state of Kansas taxes us. And what do they use that money for? They use it for education and roads. That's the two biggest ones, right? But now with these grants, if they want to get money from the federal government, now the federal government is determining what our state legislature is having to spend money on. Not you and I having elected them. Now the federal government has a say in how state money is being spent. You follow me? And it all began with that little bit of crack I gave you. You understand? And it's gotten worse and worse. I'm going to show you how it does. Okay? Mouse is over here. Write this down. Block grants. Okay? So you got categorical block grants, block grants. Okay? Those, those, that and revenue sharing, those are the three kind of you need to know for the test. Okay? Now, Block grants are funds that can be used in a broadly defined area. So think block, broad, BB, right? Block, broad, all right? So states like these more because they have more freedom to do with the money, okay? So welfare, health, education, that could be a lot of different things, right? It could be used for public transportation. That could be uh, buses, could be rail, okay? Um, that sort of thing. Airports, public transportation. Roads, public transportation. Anti-crime could be more cops, could be more jails, could be uh, community policing programs, stuff like that. Okay, youth activities, lots of different things. Let's build some recreation for the kids so they stay out of trouble. Okay, so it, it gives you more uh, leeway. Okay, states for these. Okay, pros and cons. Uh, well, the pros and cons is that money originates in the states and then they send it back to us and tell us what to spend it on instead of us deciding that on ourselves, on our own, okay? There's your, there's your con, okay? Your pro is, you know, maybe they, they're smarter than we are and they know better how to spend our money than we do because we're just hicks and hayseeds out here in Kansas. We don't know what we're doing, so they need to direct us. Get me started. Okay, what was this graph on the last page? I want to look at this graph real quick. Oh, look at this. Holy crap, okay? This is, okay, funding in billions from the national government to the states. And remember, it started in a new deal with just a little bit, $500, $500 million for the unemployed. It was the first time, okay? So now in 1977, you're looking at, I don't know, this is billions, okay? So not very much. Now look at it. Now this stops in 2006, okay? Uh, what do I have here? This is in the way. Payment for something, capital investment. Okay. And you can just see the growth here. This is 514 billion. This goes up to 2011, 514 billion. Okay, that's what the national government's giving to the states. I got more. Okay, let's go to this one. Okay, this is a 1981, okay, through 2007. So 14 years ago, okay. This is just health and human services, okay, same time period, but I, I can track these for you. Okay, transportation right here. Okay, so 20 billion, okay, uh, in 1981, it went down, that's Reagan, okay. Mid 80s stays pretty flat, okay. You get to Bill Clinton, transportation funding starts to go up, okay. You get to uh, George W. Bush, woo, doggy. Let's go, cowboy. All right, here we go, transportation money. Okay, Republicans and Democrats, all right? Uh, what's this one here? Uh, other agencies. This one, education. Okay, remember, they didn't start the U.S. Department of Education until 1976. So funding for uh, public education, right in here, about $7 billion. Okay, yep, yep, yep. Oh, what's this? 2000, George W. Bush, no child left behind. Here we go. Woo-hoo. Yeah. Okay, then you, you get the Obama in here in 2006, uh, 2000, what year was he? 08, he's not even on here, okay? So that's all Bush right there. Bush, a Republican. Agriculture, steady, steady, okay? <laughs> now, check this out. What was created in 1964? Healthcare program. Medicare. 
Okay, this is health care for the elderly, right? That everybody wastes you. Got to get to 65, I can get Medicare, right? Well, guys, the thing about Medicare is you only qualify for Medicare if you're poor. Okay, if you save money and you invest money and you have assets when you're 65 and you have income, you're not qualifying for Medicare. Good news, though, the government will let you buy into Medicare, even though you've been paying Medicare taxes your entire freaking life. You still have to buy in more and pay more to get into that Medicare, okay? So, like, when Mr. Barber retires here next year or two, he's going to say, uh, all right, I'm 65, I get my Medicare. Okay, it's cheaper than regular health insurance, you know what I mean? Okay, so you got to buy into the system. Even though my dad paid into it from 1964 on, when he needed it, guess what? It wasn't there. You guys know Mr. Berman, who's the, the counselor? He's retiring, man. His dad, uh, so his brother sick, he's in the nursing home, he's got dementia, he says $8,000 a month, full-time nursing care for dementia patients, $8,000 a month, okay, so what they want you to do, what they want Berman's brother to do is go through all of his assets that he saved over his entire lifetime, even though he paid these taxes all that time, become poor, and then Medicare will pick it up, thank you very much. You got to work the system, people. Listen, and I told Mr. Berman what we did. You got grandma, grandpa that's in a nursing home, four to five thousand dollars a month. They want you to sell the house, use all those assets. Okay, if you can get grandpa into the hospital, get him admitted to the hospital. Okay, from the nursing home to the hospital, get him out of the hospital, send him back to nursing home. Medicare generally picks up the next hundred days, poor or not. So we did that twice with my dad. You got to work the system, man. My dad paid for that crap. Come on. You know what I'm saying? You all are paying for it. Okay? All right, that was 1964. So we look at health programs and subsidies to state and local governments. All right? What happened in 2009? Obamacare, baby. Woo! Here we go. All right? Subsidies to the states. Okay? Non-health programs. Started with the New Deal, and then really with the New Deal, not that much, but as you can see, guys, this is Reagan. Okay, and down here, okay, George W. Bush. That's when I stopped giving money to the Republican Party. So quit acting like Democrats, man. Come on. Bush is worse than the Democrats, or you could just call them diet Democrats. They're all the same. They're all spending. They don't care about the national debt. They all care about getting reelected. Mm hmm. Oh, I got more. Let's go. Now, this one's a scary one. Okay. Now, pay attention here. This is an aggregate of all 50 states. Okay. And what you're looking at is where states get the money they need to spend to do the roads, to do the education, to do the things that a state does. This goes back to 2005. This is a small sampling of 10 years or five years. Okay. From general funds. You know when you go get your tax? You know, in Kansas, when you get your tags for your car, you pay those tags based on the value of your vehicle, right? Yeah, huh? Okay. Any guys got a hunting license, fishing license, any kind of license? You got a license to drive, you paid a fee for it, okay? These are general funds. You go to the state park, you pay a fee to go to the state park, that's general funds. You use the turnpike, general funds. You got me? Those aren't taxes. The red, that's 36% of what states, where they get the revenue from general funds, okay? And then other funds, taxes, I guess taxes are included in this, and then other funds would be the stuff I just talked about, okay? Now, today, 2000, well, this is 2010, okay? 34% of all the money that states, on average, use comes from the federal government. A third. So that little bit of crack we gave you back in 1978, guys, that little 1% said, hey, here, here's a little bit of money. Now, 34% of all funding that states spent comes from the national government. Think about that. Who is dependent on the national government for their subsistence today? The states are. They can't survive without it. They got it. They got them by you know what. They got them. It's over, right? Who gets to make the decisions? Well, guys, who controls the money? That's who gets to make the decisions. 
okay? Most Americans have no freaking clue about this. It's all happened in the last 50 years. Okay, I don't mean to be depressing here. What I want you to do is pay attention. If you don't like it, then you need to stand up and vote for people that want to return that power to the states. Not all powers, not to have slavery, not to mistreat human beings, not to have segregation laws or anything like that. That's silly. Okay? Nobody agrees with that, anybody with any brains. Okay? But to make decisions locally, to keep that money in the state so that we have a bigger say in how our money is spent. This is just another one, dude. Look at this. Everything has changed. And most people have no clue. Go ask somebody on the street, one of your classmates. You, you can ask any senior, too, because most of them don't know. What the heck, What is federalism? Go ask your parents. What is federalism? People don't know. And if you don't know what you have, is it easy to take it away? We are quickly turning into that unitary system. We talked about confederal, federal, and unitary, where most decisions are made at the national capital. Okay? We are one of the few federalist countries in the world today. And we're doing away with that through this funding and control. I do too. All right, let me give you a few more little things on here. You don't have to write this down. Now, some of these make sense, and I don't mean to just rail against the federal government. Here. Some of this is good, some of it is not, in my opinion. Okay? So you look at the Asbestos Hazard Act of 1986. You guys know this school's full of asbestos, right? It was. And when they did the, re the HVAC system, you know the HVAC system that we we're trying to raise $4 million for right now? You know what I'm talking about? That one? Well, listen, most of the cost wasn't the actual physical air conditioning and heating systems, or the ducts, it was the asbestos removal. And it says, the law says that if you do some type of improvement to your building, you've got to remove the asbestos. Okay, and hey, probably a good idea because asbestos, when inhaled, especially in young, developing lungs, causes cancer. Okay, so probably a good idea. But that's where the real money is, to remove that hazardous waste, okay? Federal Clean Air Act, states are given money. Sometimes states aren't given money. So you have funded mandates and you have unfunded mandates. What is a mandate? Mandates are when they tell you do something. Now look at this one here, 1986. This one impacted me, okay? They said to the states, this is control right here. You guys know that the drinking age of 21 is not a federal law. There's 50 states, and all 50 states have the same drinking age. That's because of federalism, okay? Strings attach. In order to get money for transportation, the states were told, if you want money to fix your roads, then you need to change your drinking age to 21. In 1986, when Florida changed their drinking age to 21, I was 17. My sister was 19. She was grandfathered in. She had already started drinking long before that. <laughs> I had to wait till I was 21. Okay. Louisiana said, hey, uh, wait a second now. We get a lot of young people in tourism down in Bourbon Street, down in Albans. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about there? Okay. And we want to keep them people coming in. Right? Yeah. So they said, screw your transportation money. We're going to keep our drinking age at 18. That lasted about two years. Okay. And the roads in Louisiana still suck. <laughs> yeah. So by 88, they all changed to 21. Okay. I got more. Uh, all right. So I've railed against the national government. Let me give it some praise for federalism. This, it is necessary. Okay. We've got to have some federal supremacy, and the environment is a big one. Okay. So, like, if states were allowed to set their own environmental codes, Mississippi could say, hey, come to our state, pollute all you want, because, guys, it's expensive not to pollute. You understand? Not to put emissions in the air, that costs money. Okay? But if Mississippi says, you do whatever you want, you can dump whatever you want in the Mississippi River, don't matter to us, okay? Just come on in and give us some jobs. 
All right? And then, now, does pollution travel? Uh-huh. It travels through the air and the water. Yes? Okay. So this is, makes sense, right? Let's have standardized environmental codes that everybody uses. Okay, that way we don't wind up in that situation. Now, California and some other states, they go beyond what the federal mandates are. You follow me? So gas, gasoline in California is a lot more expensive than it is in Kansas because they have much higher fuel standards. Okay? So they're free to do that, and people are free to move. Okay? You can move to whatever state you want. It's a free country. Okay? This is a big one, right? The Bill of Rights, the 14th Amendment, the federal government overseas protects your rights in the states. And this is big because in many states, we know Jim Crow, right? In many states, guys, they were not protecting people's rights, their civil rights, their liberties. They were taking those away from people. So that's what the national government does. It provides that umbrella to protect yours and my rights in the states. Yes? So don't get me wrong here, okay? There is a role for the federal government. And it's just my opinion, and this it's truly just my opinion, that it's gone beyond what it was supposed to in the last 50 years for sure, okay? Yeah, 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 because I saw this one on the test. I'm like, oh, crap, I, didn't, I don't think I talked about that. So write this down. Okay, all right, listen, the neat thing about states and giving states latitude to try their own things is you've got 50 different laboratories, right? <laughs> what do you do in a laboratory? You test, you experiment, right? With solutions to different problems. You with me? Okay, and guys, believe it or not, not all the smart people live in Washington, D.C. There are smart people in every state. And smart governors. And smart mayors. And city council people. You know what I mean? They, they come up with good ideas to solve problems, like community policing. In some communities, guys, even large ones, the relationship between police and the community are very good. Which touch is generally one of those cities. And we're a pretty big city. We've got a sheriff that does a lot of outreach with the community. Okay, as soon as he was elected, he was having programs. Hey, let's have a picnic down at McAdams Park, barbecue. Police are gonna be down there. There's gonna be free food and stuff Come and games. Come on down, meet the police. Get to know them, bring your kids. Let's build a relationship. Really smart stuff, okay? Conduct these experiences with solutions to problems, new policies. The biggest one that we can point to here is in 1996. Um, the, the governor of uh, Michigan and the governor of Wisconsin, they were allowed, they, they tried some different things with welfare. And we talked about this the first couple of weeks of the class, um, where they, they said to people, look, we're going to give you welfare if, if you need it, okay? But you can only be on it for a certain amount of time. All right? And then you got to get your crap together, okay? And if you fall on hard times again, we'll help you out again. But we're not going to keep doing this throughout your life. They tried this out. They got people into jobs programs, into, into school to improve their skills. And then President uh, Bill Clinton, a Democrat, looked at what was happening in the states with welfare, and he said, this, this is working. And so he said, hey, let's try this national. And so they adopted what they were doing in those two states. And guys, now Hillary... First lady, she wasn't one for this, okay? But Bill Clinton was for it, and the Republicans were for it. And they signed it, they passed it. And millions of people, I'm talking like 20 million people, got off of welfare and went to work, went to school. Their lives improved instead of being dependent on the government. You follow me? That doesn't happen if you don't have these laboratories of democracy. What is a laboratory of democracy? A state. States are sometimes called what? Laboratories. Laboratories of democracy. Okay, good. Got it? Got it? That's a fill in the blank. Oh, my goodness. All right, here we go. We'll take like five days on this with my regular class, okay? They're not here yet? Uh, they're taking the Constitution test today. So this is chapter four. We're taking chapter three test today. All right, all right. Better, better. Okay. So, see the tug of war. Uh huh. Okay. 
Now, some people really don't like, like Zone Fundamentals. You guys heard of the ADA? The Americans with Disability Act, signed by a Republican president, by the way, George Herbert Walker Bush in 1991. Okay, listen, the football stadium out here. Okay, so if we want to expand the football stadium so we get back back to normal and so forth, and we have really good teams and our school student body grows, and we got we don't have enough seats for people on Friday night, right? So they want to expand the stadium. According to ADA, is if you improve a facility just like the HVAC, you're going to have to make that. ADA accessible. You'll have ramps, elevator up to the press box, and really I'm surprised because that press box is pretty new. The one we have now is, I mean, it's not grandiose or anything, but it's new because the old one was like literally falling apart. And so um, I'm surprised we didn't have to build an elevator up to that. Okay. But that, that's the type of thing, you know, what I'm talking about. You, you, these mandates cost money. Okay. Sometimes the government gives you money to do them, sometimes they don't. Let me give you one more example before we get out of here. Guys, in 1976, we were having an, an energy crisis, okay? OPEC, the uh, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, put an embargo on selling oil to the United States. We had lines at the gas stations. Ask your parents about this. Jimmy Carter was president. He said, guys, we got to conserve truth. we got to conserve energy. We've got to conserve fuel. And so he said to the states, if you want money for transportation, you will change your speed limit on your highways to 55 miles an hour. Oh, no. I can't drive 55. <laughs> For 20 years, the fastest you could drive on any highway in America was 55 miles an hour. No way, man. Have any you taken a road trip recently? Yeah, this weekend. Where are you going? I live in Manhattan. Manhattan? That's uh, not very far. Any guys drive to Colorado recently? Texas. Texas? Can you imagine driving to the Gold Coast or to Colorado or to California driving 55? I can't. Guys, but in 1994, the Republicans took back Congress and they said, listen, Wyoming is different than New York. Yes? Let those states choose. All right, you're ready. Study hard. Yeah, don't split.